Hello and welcome to the Baby Giants Investing Podcast. Join us as we chat about the weird and wild world of small cap investing, all while searching for the precious few fast-growing businesses that have a shot at becoming industry giants. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. Podcast guests and their clients may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. All right, we're live. Here we go, guys. What have we got? We've got some good news today. Well, I don't need to reach for much good news if you've been following the following what's happening on Twitter because a report came out. I think this X. came out maybe. What's that? Say it again. X. Oh, Twitter. Yeah, X. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not happening. <laughs> it's Twitter. Yeah, there was a. We can a, piss Elon, Elon Musk <laughs> off by just calling it Twitter. Like, mate, that is just a free win. Uh, hopefully, he's got better things to do. The good news is that there is a preprint research paper indicating that there is a room temperature superconductor. Everyone's very excited about the potential technological implications of this. Andrew, do you want to give us a quick rundown? What would it mean if we had a room temperature superconductor? It, it basically means that we're living in like Star Trek land okay um, i like just, it just instantly transported to star trek land yeah okay like, what does what it, does that mean practically so, what, what are the some of the things yeah so it's really crazy so a superconductor is a material that just has um, no resistance so it basically means that you can transmit electricity without losing any energy and we can do it right we just have to do it at really really cold temperatures or really extreme kind of pressures which is very hard to do and it's very expensive to do so if we could do it at room temperature and ambient pressure as this paper as you say Matt it's, it's not peer reviewed so and there's there are there are some people who doubt it and there's probably good reason to doubt it and hey we got to let science do its thing right the whole whole point of science is to try and falsify things but if it's if it's shown to be true this new material they call LK99 it's a game changer. The big one, I guess the obvious one is energy transmission. So, so much of the electricity we produce is just lost down transmission lines. So, we would have we would have energy transmission that was orders of magnitude more efficient. Electronics would be orders of magnitude more efficient. You don't need a fan in your computer anymore. There's no heat, right? Like heat is caused from the resistance. So, that just that makes things so much better. You could have potentially a quantum computer on your desktop if you've ever seen these machines, they have all these super cooling materials around them because you need you need superconductors to sort of run them because the qubits just don't operate very well without that. And so that's a massive game changer. You now can have nuclear fusion reactors, which you can completely redesign reactors to make sure that fusion could be obtained with much less energy input, much more stable. I mean, that's a game changer. Just if, if, if this did nothing else, that's a game changer, right? If it just did quantum computing, that's a game changer. It does battery tech material. You can throw some a current into a loop and it'll just spin mm. infinitely until you need it. Like, holy crap, Like that's, that's a big, big freaking deal. That's really crazy. MRI machines that like are super cheap, right? Like that's massive. Maglev trains and transport, like it is so huge. And what was really tantalizing about this is that this wasn't a material that was like really difficult to make, or really expensive to make. So I'm getting, and Twitter is getting, or X is getting so far ahead of itself here as to not be funny, but the promise and the potential here is just just game changing. So I'm, I'm yeah. super psyched about it. That's wild. Claude, what do you reckon about the, uh, the superconductor buzz? I just feel like it's already been overdone. So you're sus. I am not as psyched as Andrew is about it. <laughs> I, I'm, I should qualify. I'm, I'm, I remain health. I have a healthy degree of skepticism. There, is, there has been a number of outfits that have, have claimed to have cracked this and has later I'm shown that slightly they- more interested in this than the whole thing about aliens. I'll say that much. <laughs> Well, wow. you know, only maybe, very maybe we, slightly. With this kind of stuff, maybe we start to open up some really Have interesting possibilities aliens. of transport. I don't know. Like, yeah. we're talking about like a percent. Of, it's all just falls in the realm of things that, like, I. It's just like niche. It's weird. I'm more interested from a sociological perspective. Like, these are all things that are just. It's literally nothing. Like, my theories about how you know the the world works and how you know, important biodiversity is, is just as valid as like them being like, Hey, we have a superconductor that doesn't levitate. And, you know, someone being like, Hey, someone told me that we saw aliens on planet earth. Like, it's just like, all like, all right, man, like let's hit it again. Have another take of the billy. Like, you know, <laughs> off you go. Whatever. You're a hard man like, to that's please. How I, see it. Hard man to- I think Dude, it's I- like interesting from a sociological perspective. And it's interesting because it's like, sometimes 
all that matters is the sociological perspective. And I'll give you your favorite example in the world about that is Bitcoin. Oh my God. Bitcoin oh my really God. I wasn't going to, here we go. Okay. <laughs> no, this is really interesting because, and I'm, I'm sad I didn't spot this earlier, is like the, the cool thing about Bitcoin is oh like God. when it first started to become, you know, mainstream, say in 2013, it had already existed for like four years. So the, the actual cryptography of it was not, not important. What was uh, important was just like the insight of the sociological wave that it would unleash. And that is like, that's real. It's so real. And that's all it needs. So that's why I find that's an interesting one. And and now I'm far more uh, like, I guess, it, you know, I just think it's an interesting example. Hence why I don't mind when you bring it up from time to time, mate. Yeah, this is completely different though, isn't it, Claude? Because this is a, a paper that will be replicated or not. So it's science. It's not just perception. It's like we will have maglev trains and batteries yeah, that but, last forever. Mate, anybody fusion. can go and publish a paper that's not peer reviewed. That's not going like that's not going to be replicated, which this also might be. Yeah, yeah. it could be, but it, we'd know soon, basically, whether it's science. It's, it's not sociological, right? It, I mean, there's a sociological whether it's a buzz around at the moment, but this is hard science. It's not like. It's not a, you don't have to believe in it or not. We're going to have yeah. either have it or not. I guess it's what, what's interesting for me is the the prospect of it. it. There are certain breakthroughs from a science and engineering perspective that just, you know, literally change everything. You know, whether it goes back to the steam engine or just telecommunications in general, or the transistor, the semiconductor. You I mean like there, there is a world before that technology exists. And there is a world after it, and 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 this is one of those milestones. That might this might completely fall over this this uh, LK ninety nine material. But if it is possible, room temperature, ambient pressure, superconductors, like if it's possible, we don't know if it is. I assume it is, and maybe it's just an engineering and and a challenge for it to get there. But it is one of those humanity okay. defining moments. I'll tell you. I'll tell you one of the like the reasoning techniques you can apply to this to be why you would be skeptical. It is if you were sitting truly on this incredible discovery, which thank you, you outlined, and it would be incredible. Why would you publish it on the like free website where it was published? Why wouldn't you sit on this, you know, make sure that like it's getting published in the biggest, most famous journal ever kind of thing? Because you're in a race. That's that's the thing that I've heard is that there's the people, the group that are trying to, that published it are basically racing to publish it because they thought there was another group that was onto it and going to publish it as well. So they want to be the first out of the gate. So that could explain that. Yeah. Sociologically or behaviorally or whatever you want to say. Just on Claude's point, I do think that there is something interesting. So I'm going to come back and agree with you now, Claude, on the sociological side, which is how the stage of the market they were in, people kind of are more looking for good news. Like it was more like the speed with it, which everyone got excited about it, I think is interesting and kind of reflects like if you think last year when everyone was very negative and the market was down people were more looking for negative news everywhere whether it's like geopolitical or anything and now people are looking for positive news because the market's up and things are trending but yeah the just to maybe round this out where we're at the prediction markets are kind of how i follow it they're kind of tracking around 25 percent ish odds of this being replicated so you could say and there's that spiked up as high as like 50 percent. so yeah we'll see it's it's as Andrew says, it's incredible breakthrough. It would also be reproduced from like pretty cheap materials. So it's not, it's not something that's, yeah, it's something that a lot of labs right now are racing to replicate it. Some have claimed to have replicated already. Others are saying that they couldn't replicate it. So we'll see. The thing is, there are like little things like this constantly, right? And it's like, I guess like once in a while, maybe, you know, next pod, like it's all been proven in two pods, like, right, you know, in two podcasts time, I'm like super psyched about it as well. And it's like, you know, what are the investment implications and et cetera, et cetera. It's all possible. It's just like the number of times that things just don't actually turn out to be that big a deal is like a lot. And then we all just forget about it and we're like mm. ready for the next thing. And yeah. so, yeah. no, I think that's a great point, know. Claude. I think last week we were even saying, should we talk about this? Because it was breaking. We're like, let's just wait a week. <laughs> and even now, I think we probably need to wait a bit longer to know. We do need to wait a bit longer. I was going to say to myself, like, I'll just wait a few days before getting up in the hype. But yeah, we'll, we'll see. At a certain point, might need to do the implications. If you look at like the hype's a self reinforcing thing, you know, like people do tweet threads about it because they think people are interested in it now. We're talking about it on the podcast because, you know, it's in the news kind of thing. It's just like, just this self reinforcing thing. I feel like there's always something in that like if you can understand these sociological movements better 
that's a key where area where just you as a normal person can get an edge in the market because that's something that like the guy that did commerce degree and accounting degree and the CFA, like, yeah, he might be capable of it as well. But none of those things that he did or she did is actually going to help in any meaningful way in understanding, you know, the, the sociological th- flows that are often, you know, so important. Like Afterpay never seemed like a great business, but just the sociological movement, th- that's the only insight you need to have. You make a massive multi-bagger. Well, I just like also too, I think for me, even with the high failure rate and the inevitable hype cycles. I love the, I think there's a valid, there's an inspirational quality to it that people dream big, do the crazy thing. You know, it's sort of like when, when you, speaking of some of those big breakthroughs before, I mean, you know, the Wright brothers were sort of like dreamers that were trying the crazy and then they changed the world. And okay, there was a thousand other Wright brothers that did stupid things and it just never panned out. But I, I'm kind of, this is where I sort of give credit to like even good old Elon, who's like clearly a nutbag, but but he's reusable rockets to Mars, you know, or, orbit-based global internet. There there are some things that I just find so uh, worthwhile, even if they're, they're dreaming big and it's crazy and a lot of them won't work. I, I far prefer that stand than the Ah, uh, most of it doesn't work out. Let's not try. I, I think that that defeatist. I know, you're not, I know you're not saying that, but I don't. My impulse point shares in Moderna on the way up, mate. Like, <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, I'm I'm all for like, wow, there's been an innovation. Like, let's punt on it. In fact, my main frustration is that in my current role, I can't do things like that. Yeah, and I'm not even coming at it from an investment point of view, frankly. I I, I tend to think what you would want to do is sit on the sidelines for a bit because you you tend to notice the, these uh, these adoption curves and these breakthroughs. They they follow very well defined patterns, right? And I think the lesson I've learned over the years is you don't have to be at the bleeding edge of this to do well. Like you can sort of wait until the dust clears a little bit and a clear winner is starting to emerge and still do insanely well. So it's sort of, yeah, there's no, there's no rush is what I would say. And, and, and there is, if there was some legitimacy to this latest sort of potential breakthrough, you can imagine a whole bunch of companies are going to start listing and VCs are going to go nuts and all this money is going to flow into it. It's like, that's great. Uh, I ain't investing at that. Yep. Makes sense. Maybe moving on to some small cap good news. Pointera shares one you've followed for a long time, Andrew. They were up like 90 percent in the morning i don't know where they close more than 100 no, yeah totally. more than 100 percent at one stage yeah. just like they that's where they open the step maybe um so point terror is a spatial imaging company i think we've covered that a bit before but maybe just give us an update what why do the shares what's your latest thinking on it why do the shares pop so much and um yeah yeah it was an insane move i mean what what a journey i so i First took a position, I think it was 2019 or so, and I've actually done pretty well with them. They, they went all the way up to 90 cents or something. Like Bevan Slattery took a position and it just got memes to all hell. It was just ridiculous, right? So I'd love to say that I held up to 90 and then managed to time the top. I didn't. I was selling a very big chunk all the way up. And then to, to before anyone mistakes me for some from trading genius, like I, I started buying back in, I want to say around 40 cents an opportunity and in hindsight it wasn't so anyway so what what basically- you're talking about your straw man trades though right not real life trades or yeah uh, yeah i mean like on yeah it's done really well for me on straw man and in and in real life but i mean look anyway it's not about me the, the the point is is that i think this is a is a company that has very interesting tech very interesting potential, very encouraging signs of growth and scaling well. And then things started to get really quiet and they stopped. They had this ACV metric that they were publishing and touting about and then just went away. <laughs> and they delayed the publishing of it. It's just, it's completely disappeared now, right? And okay, that was interesting. And then things, and then a lot of the hot money that fl- flowed into it flowed out and it was sort of languishing below 10 cents and just like absolute silence from the company. Anyway, so one of their big e- entity is a big utility provider over in the US said that they've got this 10 year, $15 billion gid- grid resilience CapEx program. They're going to be partnering with Pointera. Pointera came out with an announcement to sort of say, well, if only, you know, we get paid this much per poll and blah, blah, blah. Then it, it, it actually, I mean, it's, it's, it's very much good news. It's not bad news in any way, shape or form, but it was pretty vague in exactly how that's going to pan out, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what spurred the the doubling of the share price. The next day they had their 4C come out and this is really disappointing, right? So they had operating cash flow was significantly negative for the quarter down 1.8 million. 
So only 800,000 in, in customer cash receipts. So just to put that in context, they did 3.25 million in the prior quarter. So this is the uh, the old that old chestnut of invoicing delays since come through in July of 1.8 million dollars. So hopefully just a timing issue there. The bit, you know they say the, the core business remains self-funded, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as as others have noted, there's 1.5 million left in the bank, right? And there is a little bit of an element of, look, this news could be well-timed if you're wanting to sort of get the, juice the share price up to do another capital raise. Maybe. It's going to be a very, very close call. <sighs> the ACV chart, again, noticeably I mean, absent they, in the they, 4C. They've got to raise capital, don't they, Andrew? Like, I mean, one they burned, well, I guess it, it depends, I guess, of this timing and cash flows, but 1.5 million left in the latest quarter, they burned, what, 1.8? Mm-hmm. Oh, man, be, that's skating very fine to not have to raise capital again. So not if if it was just a timing issue. I mean, you're right. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sort of play it both ways here. Maybe not, but certainly well, yeah, yeah, pretty yeah, decent chance. Team. Pretty decent chance, right? I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out uh, at all. And again, I've, I've look just outside of Point Terra. I think in general we are all too cynical when it comes to capital raises. Like anyone who's started trying to get a business off the ground knows that it takes capital and it's more about the return on that investment on on the capital raised more than more than anything else. But this is a there there are there are serial offenders that are out there that are just continue to raise and just like just there's no noticeable return on that investment. And it's always you know we, we'd probably class it as a, these companies as gunner companies companies all the potential in the world seemingly but just never managed to sort of scale effectively so yeah i've got a small position still i sort of like to give them the benefit of the doubt but they're really making it they're making it hard <laughs> is what i would say and even if you wanted to take the, the the more optimistic view of this i just think the communication the ir around this has just been an absolute masterclass in what not to do i'm i'm with you on that mate but let me tell you i formed the view that i did not have confidence in management when when the stock was four cents and completely actually bought the stock when it was like four say 4.3 cents and sold it when it was 4.4 cents and then watched on the sidelines as it went to like 90 cents just being like i've done it again (laughs) (laughs) well yeah we'll see i guess someone will be proven right it's the game's not over necessarily i guess but yeah it's up multiple multiples from there at the moment i mean the cool thing about it is that the potential business model is one whereby it could end up being you know sticky recurring revenue automatic growing kind of company so you can have medically situation where they're storing all this data and it becomes this sort of sticky hard thing to change and then also as companies are continuing to collect more data like the price they're paying to point error just keeps going up and up little by little as they develop their own operations the, the tech is legit. I think that's overshadowed by the fact that, you know, they give these ACV numbers and then the cash flow. Never, never have I managed to like, you know, really fully understand the relationship between their ACV that they give in one quarter and their subsequent, you know, receipts from customers the next quarter. Yeah. Like yeah, even as you were saying, you know, you saw the, it's laughable that what I described in terms of, you know, this recurring sticky high margin style stuff, that does not fit up in any way with like, you know, the cash flows that they're actually receiving. Like the story that I told you about why it could be cool does not match up with the cash flows we're seeing. And that's why that's why I'm not like enthusiast on this stock. Yeah. So the explanation there offered by management is very lumpy, people on different payment cycles. So some customers paying month to month, others paying multi years in advance, rah, rah, rah. So it's kind of like it, you know, it it, it makes sense. So you, you, you basically why you that's did, the case, but that doesn't ma- like that doesn't match up with the story I told, where you're providing this important, ongoing, sticky, hard to change surface. Because if you're doing all those things, you say, right, here are the terms. You know, every time you view a new radiology scan on my viewing software, you pay money. That's what happens when you have that kind of business, and that's the kind of business that point error sometimes gets portrayed as, but I don't think for some reason, which I don't understand, I don't think it is that kind of business. I look, I, I totally get it. And I'm really, I'm really just coming at it from the other angle to sort of straw man it, I guess, um, or steel man it perhaps. I'm basically saying that I think that 
the management are over promotional, which is exactly what you're saying as well. But I just I'm getting into why I think they're over promotional. I think Claude's point is that it's not something that would be how do I say it? <laughs> if the business was really in de- that kind of demand or that important, then it would probably have a better cash flow cycle because it could invoice and be paid earlier. Exactly what I'm saying. So what I think is that the story that some people believe is true for Pointera, which is that it's this kind of sticky, mission critical, business to business, usage based sort of software style service, that does not not match up with you know the reported receipts from customers and because you're like you see that in the fact where for a company that truly has just a say a usage based revenue model or a usage or subscription based re- revenue model such as say Prometicus you're going to see like the cash flows are very good like they match up pretty well with the revenue each each time and for a company that has a mixture and is saying hey we have a mixture of recurring revenue and I, I own shares in both Prometicus and Alcidian and so Alcidian's like we've got a mixture of recurring revenue and lumpy revenue and you and you kind of see that in that the cash flows kind of match the revenue but there are situations where that they can get a lumpy cash flow you know up front which is when they have the what which they say they have lumpy and stuff like that but with with pointera based on the cat on the cash flow statements and the up and downness of it i think that don't think that there's very much of a recurring transactional ongoing sticky high margin business there and and so i would question how much and that may well be part of the story like they still had 700 and something thousand dollars receipts from customers in the last quarter so there's obviously some element that's always there but i just wonder how much that is yeah yeah i I, look there's also the element and again i'm just devil's advocating this as well i always find it very interesting when you have businesses that are positioned well for a structural change and this is exactly it's what prometicus did and this is potentially (laughs) very careful well it's what alcidian is 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 potentially doing and it's what it's what Pointera is 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 trying to do, right? Just just the very manner in which data is stored, processed is is completely changing. Now that takes time. These are typically you're dealing with these, particularly in the states, these huge utility companies, which are just very very slow moving behemoths that 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 tread very carefully. So we here as investors sit back and we look at this over the last couple of years and go, ah, oh, where's where's show us the proof? And it's like, well, it's literally been a few years, right, in this journey. Now they might completely fail in 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 name and they probably fair to say that some a lot of this has been overhyped and you can point some of the, the blame there at management. So absolutely that is all true. But I would also posit if they are indeed on that path, probably what you would expect. It just takes time for this kind of stuff to ripen. Look how long it's taken any of you guys to build your businesses or any other businesses that we see. It just it takes years. And we as investors, we see the potential and then we kind of expect that next quarter that's just all all in train. I mean, again, let's look at ProMedicus Claude. That was 10 years ago that some of this stuff started to take off, right? And it just, different pricing models and, and all the rest in that. Guess what I, what am I trying to say here? I think maybe to some, yeah, I, I can I can kind of, for people that aren't familiar, because we're getting a bit into the weeds of what, I think it's a really good point Claude makes is like the, the cash flow cycle, we talk about that is like, if you have a lot of power, like power over your customers, then you would expect them to pay regularly, quickly. And that's kind of what we see with other companies that have a lot of power. And that's how you get pricing power and stuff. But I guess, Andrew, your kind of counterpoint is that they're still small, like they're still small relative to those customers. So it's something that you'd expect to see grow over time. So yeah, I think I think both could be valid. That's the that's the two thesis. They're testing it out. They're they're trying to disrupt workflows. You know, it just I mean it just it's what it's going to look like even under the optimistic scenario. Now I'm not saying it is the that that it's what it's going to be. So I don't I can just see in three months time someone saying, oh Andrew was pumping. I'm not pumping you right like there's a lot of red flags here. I want to be a hundred percent clear on that. I'm not really shit canning it either. Like I told the story of how like sometimes my, where I set the bar for what I'm willing to tolerate with management styles can sometimes exclude me from certain winners. And yeah, that yeah like that's just the way it is. It's a spicy one. Do your own diligence. <laughs> it's a spicy one. Where, where, yeah. Where the where the oven mitts. All right, should we jump to some good news? Because Hello World was one, I think, as we were just coming through, Claude. Maybe. Yeah, we can. You. Let's let's just race through them because we know that people like the older small cat good news bit from time to time. So we got sort of Hello World, which I think is always an interesting one. It being in uh, travel, and so I think that I view personally, you know, travel and retail as to some degree barometers for the overall economy, mm. uh, and I think. We've seen the retailers bounce back. Well, these guys still reporting, I think, 
uh, in the vicinity of a 10% EBITDA upgrade to their underlying EBITDA. So you can imagine, uh, you know, I'm not getting super excited about this, but nonetheless, they also gave some sort of outlook statements as well that essentially uh, implied that, you know, they, they still think it's going very well. They say leisure demand continues to hold up strongly on both sides of the Tasman. So yeah, good news from them. Their business remains in, in decent shape and it seems like demand is there as well. Yeah, yeah I'll just nice. add, to, add to that, Cooks. When you mentioned it, I, I had a quick squeeze at it. So the underlying EBITDA forecast for the full year now, 42 to $45 million. So that was an upgrade from 38 to 42 guidance issued in April, which itself was an upgrade from 28 to 32 million issued in February. On top of that, saying all segments are now operating profitably. They give, I've got to say, this is the, here's a mark against the, this announcement was they're talking about the percentage change on a year ago. So I was like, well, a year ago, you were saying how anomalous this was because of COVID and rah, rah, rah. And it, I, <laughs> I just feel as though you need to normalize all of this kind of stuff because of course, obviously the, the percentage gain is going to look insane. But you are 100% right to point out that it's just like, wow, this is something that is hyper cyclical, hyper discretionary. And for all the dark macro storm clouds that are out there, things are holding up actually insanely well. Yeah. Uh, on, on, you know, on top of that, they're actually, they're making hay while the sun shines. This is always the case when you see sectors or economies get into tough times. It's like the stronger players snap up the weaker players. They emerge in a more consolidated, stronger uh, foundation. So look, I don't own shares. Um, I'm not trying to spruik it. I've got no intention of buying them. It's not my bag. But an EV to EBITDA ratio of about 10 for a business that should emerge, you know, zero debt. All these acquisitions are self-funded. You know, it's, it, it, it's just noteworthy and I think worth pointing out in terms of the section of good news for, for what has been a really tough place to be. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting company as well. Like a lot of, I think, government work from memory. My knowledge might be a little bit, little bit out of date there. So various factors there. But overall, yeah, positive news for them. Maybe some other good news. Was it Drone Shield, Andrew? Were you following that one? Well, yeah, we spoke to Oleg Vonek, the CEO, recently. Oh, they just had an announcement out this morning as well. Something I uh, launching area-specific satellite denial systems. I thought that's what you were going to chat about. But no, maybe, maybe oh, run through what, you, how they're oh, calling it. You, I actually haven't had a chance to, to dive into that, but it does look encouraging. The market's reacted well. Look, it's a, look, it's a business that I think is is like, when was it, 2016 it listed? It's kind of that one that sort of makes you giggle a little bit, like drones, are you serious? Like, you know, it just it just seemed a bit funny, but it's a legit business, man. And their revenues have been growing really well. And obviously Ukraine, as tragic as that is, has been like a, a pretty, pretty strong tailwind for them. And they've just seen all of these massive contracts come through. So they haven't given guidance, but they did like 17 million in revenue last year. If you just wash through what has already been announced, there's somewhere in the vicinity of 70 million this year. Oleg basically, he didn't give a number, but he said, use the term easily profitable. Plus they've raised $40 million earlier this year because they, they're bulking up their manufacturing and bulking up their inventory just due to the demand here. So it's sort of like, and the other thing that's interesting too, is you get a few examples of this where it's this ostensibly sort of small cap Aussie ASX listed company that's like a legitimate global leader in this space. I think the other thing that's interesting for me about Drone Shield is that he, he made mention of how difficult it is dealing with these clients. You've got to imagine the security security concerns and checks and balances that need to happen before you can sort of deal with these potential customers. Once you're on the other side of that, and now they've got like, they've got all that sort of done. It's it's actually, things can move really quickly. So this recent, in July, they announced a $33 million contract with the US Department of Defense. <laughs> You're only going to need a couple of those, you know, it really sort of swings things around. So I, I feel as though it's a company that has good tech, good tailwinds, good market position, likely to grow very quickly, likely to be self-funding going forward forward yeah 200 mil pipeline 10 billion dollar market you know i don't know it's in, it's interesting it's going to be it's going to be something that's going to, i'm sure is going to be a very wild ride but if you want to play the world's going to hell in a handbasket kind of angle and you like the defense side of things i, I think I think it's interesting. Did you have any thoughts on the director of sales? Did you? Yeah, I asked him point blank, yeah. actually. Mm. So, so it sold 18% of his position, was it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there, someone made the point on Strama, which is a good one, is that like they're, they're using the fully diluted share count there, so some unvested stuff. But his answer was, so the way that the ATO treats 
options conversion. So when your options convert, that's a taxable event. So we needed to we needed to pay for some tax. Okay, fair enough. Might not have needed to sell that many to pay for tax. The other angle, which I like, I'll pay this, right? I think business owners and founders get it more than than others. But it's sort of like, well, I've been on below market rates. I'm not the founder, but I've basically been in the position of founding, growing this, been, and he's been there for eight, nine years and taking it from an extremely early stage business of like 11 employees to where it is today. I was like, he didn't, didn't use these terms. I was like, I wanted some money. I don't want to, and, and by the way, I've still got a very substantial shareholding. It's like, I, I kind of respect that. You know, it's kind of like the best, by the way, the best example ever of this was uh, his name, Marcus Blackmore, who, who, who had that announcement saying, I'm going to buy a yacht, yo, <laughs> and just did it, right? And it was like, I will, I, will t- I, will, I will totally respect the straightforward nature of that. So I'm not too concerned about it. Look, if there is a, if there is further ongoing sales, I mean, that is, that is, that is very, very, very different story, but taking a bit of cash off the table after a long, hard grind, I kind of think, yeah, I, I, I'd probably be pretty, you know, at a point I'm going to get sick of renting, right? (laughs) At a point I'm going to get sick of driving the crappy car. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Like we're all, I don't know. Am I being, am I being too kind? No, I, I don't think there's, I, I agree that directors need to sell sometimes. So you could say maybe it's like a big chunk. I, I'm yeah, always cautious. Chunk. There was another company I met with who they kind of said that we think this is going to be like a billion dollar company. It's going to multi-bag and everything's amazing. And then they, they, they're also planning to actively selling shares. Like even when I asked, like, will you sell shares? Like, yeah, we'll sell some shares, like right. quite a lot. And so I don't know, there's, yeah, I, I can see both sides. And I, I know Claude, you, you tend to kind of wait and direct to selling more, but maybe not on that topic. Do you have any thoughts on drone, drone shield generally? I don't know if you looked at that one much before. Yeah, look, I, I think it's probably like an attractive momentum trade. It's, it's probably an example of why I'm kind of frustrated when I'm writing about stocks and writing about my investments and stuff like that. Honestly, the the whole process of walking people through like, yeah, I don't really like the economics of this company, but I basically think that it's a momentum trade is not like a very fun process. And also it's not really, yeah, it's just not, not fitting where I am right now, but I think that it's just like, it's just such a narrative, you know, and also the narrative is backed up by some certain facts, which is like, they obviously are involved in selling equipment to the allies, you know, and demand for this kind of equipment is going up and drones are just generally becoming infinitely more important in warfare. So right place, right time and genuine actual contracts coming through. What are their margins, yada, yada, how profitable, how sustainable, et cetera, et cetera. All questions that do not attract me to this company. Oh, the margins uh, are very high. Don't, don't. So I asked him about that as well. So the even on the hardware, the mar- again, he, they don't disclose for his, – his, his, his reason was we don't, we don't want to like allow our customers to negotiate too hard. But he sort of suggested mm-hmm. that it was sort of well north of 40% on the hardware. Not, not bad for hardware. I think – I don't know. Bad. Yeah, I'm sus on the customer. I guess it depends who you're selling to, but normally these procurement things, they they just force you to tell them what like what every all your costs and stuff. Like I don't know. I guess it depends on how big the government. Don't forget they're selling to ports and airports and stuff. Yeah, so okay, that's true. I'm, I'm thinking more of Department of Defense procurement. Uh, sure those, those guys, guys know what their margins are. Like I mean, they probably wiretapped your office for like a year. Before they might <laughs> yeah, be. true, true. <laughs> but there's like there are other sort of military supplies on the ASX that trade on like sub 10 PE ratios. They've got a terrible history. Yeah, like uh, that's what has always held me back when I've looked at I think like EOS is another one, right? Yes. This is a whole whole host of other things going on with it. But yeah, you you get really excited from a big contract, but then the margins are so small. I think it's interesting, Andrew, that they're selling to ports and airports and other things. That that, that changes the game a bit because the the problem is defense. The worst moment is like when you win the contract because then you've got to deliver what you promised and you're like the lowest bidder and the tiniest margins. So And you've got to build ahead of time too because I made the point. Well, again, it's like we need, we need, you know, thousand any drone unit i was like hey, we need it in like three months and you can't say okay we'll just give us a year and a half to make it all and then ship it to you it's like no no no, we need it so there is there is a very necessary skill in balancing inventory with expected demand and if, if things go wrong on that you overbuild or underbuild <laughs> there's there's risks with that so it's a it's a totally legit point it's- it's a classic capital intensive business. Like this is not how I would conclude one should invest based on reading Warren Buffett's post inflation era at letters. Yeah. So they're guiding, well, not guiding, maybe it's the aspiration here is 300, 500 million. In I love those years. aspirational guidances. These yeah. are <laughs> yeah, me too. It's not I, guidance, but I, you know, I, hook, yeah, yeah. I put my hooks into those 
big time. Give me a portfolio of companies that don't have a single <laughs> aspirational guidance between them. <laughs> it can be good. Like I think there's like a small percent where it's actually a good thing, but yeah. That's true. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say they're suggesting that 50% of those revenues will be from software and uh, IP related R&D contract work. So so in other words, and th- and that is a big subscription recurring element to uh, tells a good story. What's that what's the software for? Is that tracking the drones and stuff? Yeah, so you've got you've got the hardware which is just detecting and disabling, but you've also got threat detection software so it, all of these there's various I think it's five classes of drones all the way up to the big what are they called? Raptors or the really cool the predators. Predators. Yeah. That's the one. I just saw that again the other day, by the way. Classic predators all the way down to the JB Hi-Fi kind of thing. So they all have unique signatures in terms of their profile, their sound, etc. And and so there's a lot of work in making sure that you are detecting what you think you are detecting and it's not a pigeon or something, you know. So yes, there's a there is a big software component to what they sell. Yeah, very nice. Just on aspirational targets, by the way, mm. I was stating what I wish was the case. I do definitely and have <laughs> own companies with with aspirational targets. I just wish they wouldn't, because I'm like, oh no. I think they're very... anchoring people to this number that you're also saying is it's going to be less than this because we're aspiring to that. Mm. The yeah, bad the bad idea. Either. Psychologically it's... crazy. I think occasionally, it, it, like, there's some companies where they just have such a clear visibility of the thing they're building where they can actually do it. But it's like, yeah, you just you get missed it messed in with a lot of companies that just want to keep raising capital and ban burning a lot of it, and that's how they justify it. And yeah, even even if you own it and they're right, it's kind of like kind of makes for a more volatile ride potentially, right? If people ask start anchoring to that too early but you do it right naturally you do it like if you're going to start a business think, well what what's the opportunity how big could we get i think we could get like if you're sitting around the 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 kitchen table trying to figure things out you know let's launch an asx newsletter how many people are i mean we, we, we're gonna talk about it internally not because of we're trying to pump anything just because like you'd be dumb not to right and then it's very natural i think when when an investor goes well what do you think and you go well it's what i think now there's a slippery slope there <laughs> and and that can be used in very nefarious ways but i i guess i, I not everything is a conspiracy oh, is well, what i'm saying thoughts are free my friend thoughts yeah, are free yeah. Yeah. My has, yeah my major is an expression dreams are free you always used to say that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dreams are free. <laughs> yeah, I think what would we, I think we'd all agree it's highly correlated to raising more capital. Oh yes, it's like it's companies that need to raise. Even zero, where it worked out, zero had big audacious goals, right? And they raised hundreds of millions of dollars to to do it many times. So yeah, maybe that's the maybe that's the, the broader conclusion. You probably need to raise. That's why you're doing it. The the, tr- the, the what's the the difficulty is is that we know that it is a minority. Of, not not every company is a monster beverages, right? Like mm-hmm. very very few are. But those that are, they're going to be giving all the same signals as the ones that, that don't <laughs> end up. If you're the kind of person who is hyper cynical at any of these things, you just never catch one. Like full stop, you never ever ever catch one. And go, it's cool. Yeah. Invest in Soul Pats in Berkshire, you'll be fine. Like no one's no one's going to blame you for doing that. <laughs> no one's listening to this for our takes on Soul Pats. <laughs> That's you, mate. <laughs> But do you know what I mean? Like, it, I, yeah. I'm not. You can flip it around and say, anytime you hear this, it's a red flag. I think, well, that that is equally as dangerous as saying that every time you see this, you should jump on it and take it as the gospel truth. There is a nuance in there, and and that there is going to be. <laughs> what am I trying to say? Is <laughs> not everything's a conspiracy, guys. Is all I'm saying. Yeah. No, I think that's a great, a great point. Maybe maybe we wrap just up some things. <laughs> a lot of things. A lot of things are just those specific everything. conspiracies. I believe. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's good. Cool. <laughs> right, guys, let's wrap it there. That was really good. Good to get some good yeah, news. Thanks, in. Andrew. That was a great rundown. You really carried us today. Well done. Yeah, <laughs> we'll find out if the conductor's real next week, maybe. Wait, thanks for raising Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Let's cut it. Cut it. Shut it down. Cut, cut. <laughs> All right. Hit us up on Twitter at Baby Giants Pod. Until next time. Thanks very much for listening. All right. Have a great day, everybody.